Happy weekend, everybody. This is Kevin, and you are listening to episode number 22 of the weekend version of the podcast. Today, we're going to talk about calibration as a risk management strategy. My name is Kevin Radzik. I've been involved in the field of calibration, measurement, and metrology for over 20 years. On the PT Guru podcast, we discuss these topics and more like quality and equipment and how all this impacts your life. My intent here is to educate and inform, but most of all is to get you to think for yourself and not just blindly listen to the system. So I welcome you to the PT Guru Podcast. All right, so welcome to the weekend version of the podcast. Glad to have you. Thank you so much for tuning in. I super, su- I'm super excited about it. Super excited about what we're going to talk about this weekend. First things first, though, this is the weekend version of the podcast. We do it up on YouTube, Facebook, some other places. Um, But during the week, we do a regular audio-only version of the podcast. Um, So first things first, we're going to tell you what you might have missed this week if you're not listening over on the audio side. And if you're wondering, it's called the PT Guru Podcast. You can find it on iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify. Ask Alexa to play the PT Guru Podcast. She shall do it for you. Um, So this week on Monday, we talked about the requirements of calibration certificates, mainly from the aspect of ISO 17025, 2017, newest version of it. Hasn't changed much since 2005. Just a couple little clarification kind of things. But good stuff there if you're wondering what should be on there. Had some questions about what's supposed to be on a calibration certificate versus what sometimes people are getting. Tuesday, kind of our metrology meets real life kind of day, and we talked about the metrology of comfort, uh, enthalpy, kind of a cool thing there, why you feel the way you do indoors especially. Um, Wednesday, kind of our, our equipment day, we talked about police radar guns. How do those things work, and how do you calibrate them? I'll give you a hint, tuning forks come into play. Kind of an interesting thought there. And then Thursday, Quality Toolkit Thursday, we talked about the Malcolm Baldrige Award, the single most prestigious award for quality you can get in the U.S. And then on Friday, again, based off some questions I got, um, what are the differences and similarities between testing versus calibration, being that they both work off the the same ISO standard? So, fun stuff there. Um, So, let's get right into some content for you and talk about calibration and how calibration is a risk management strategy. So with all of our fun little updates to ISO 9001 in 2015, uh, it took a couple of years, but they've kind of tapered their way out into a lot of the other standards and such. But one of those big buzz phrases that's come out of there and is added to the quality world is risk management. Now, sure, the concept has been around forever, but uh, now it's starting, it's becoming more of a shall than a should obviously. And now auditors are starting to ask the question, you know, what are you doing about risk management? That's a good question. It's important. As ISO 9001 goes, so too do all the other specialized versions of ISO 9001. So we got 16949 for automotive, 9100 for aerospace, and they're going to, they're, they've already followed suit. They're already asking for a lot of these risk management things to be implemented. Uh, so, And it doesn't end there. The changes are really flowing out to most other standards that contain any kind of quality system as part of the actual standard in some way, shape, or form. Anyway, we want to call it risk management, much like continuous improvement. There's our buzzword of five or ten years ago. Um, they're here to stay. And it's an important part of any quality system in this day and age. So, what exactly is risk management? What does it mean? Uh, Good question. Uh, So, a little uh, web search tells us that risk management is the identification, evaluation, and prioritization of risks, you know, potential problems, basically. And that's defined in ISO 31000, if you're looking for some definitions, as the effect of uncertainty on objectives. Um, followed by coordinated and economical application of resources to minimize, monitor, and control the probability or impact of unfortunate events. Love that phrase, unfortunate events. Lemony snickets, here we come. Um, 
or to maximize the realization of opportunities. So this works in both ways. We're not just talking worrying about you know what bad could happen, but we're also looking at it saying, hey, how can we turn this into a better sort of thing? Um, so risk management's objective is to assure uncertainty, here's that word again, one of our favorites, uh, does not deflect the endeavor from the business goals. Uh, that whole paragraph there, minus my little inserts, it just kind of came straight out of Wikipedia. Good stuff there. Um, so the goal here is not to completely remove risk from the equation. Uh, that's not possible. Uh, what we need to do is be aware of it, understand the magnitude of it, how big of a risk are we dealing with in certain situations, and then take steps where it's reasonable to mitigate it. And notice I say reasonable. Um, we could take steps to minimize the risk of an asteroid hitting the top of this building. Not that high on the priority list. There's a few more things to worry about first. Um, that's that whole reasonable part here. Um, and like we've talked about a million times, okay, maybe not a million, but uh, you can't completely remove uncertainty from any situation. Of course, there's a risk of an asteroid hitting this building right now while I'm recording this podcast. That is a real risk. What is the likelihood of it? It's infinitesimally small. So if you know where it is and how big at that uncertainty is, um, you can work around it. That's what we talk about a lot. That's part of uncertainty. Um, risk and uncertainty kind of tie right into on one another in an amazing way. Um, so let's talk about uncertainty and risk uh, with calibration. Uh, so let's say you're making something. You're making some kind of product. It's a lot of what we all do a lot of what we're talking about with some of these things you know we set up the machine or we have a person do some process we need to really measure the output of that process to mitigate that uncertainty to mitigate the risk that we're not putting out what we're supposed to put out now imagine if we just set up the machine and said go and it spits out some form of widget drops it into a box and off to the customer it goes it's gone now if we're talking about door stops Maybe this is fine. Even something otherwise viewed as a reject still stops a door. So there's very little risk involved. Uh, even if something happens during the manufacturing run, you may still get reasonably decent parts. So our risk is pretty low anyway. Conversely, what if we've got a machine that's 3D printing airplane parts? Uh, well, those might just need a bit more scrutiny. Um, the risk of the part itself demand some form of a closer look to ensure the part is within its expected tolerances. Now with our door stops, we could reduce risk if we wanted to by adding something like a simple periodic visual inspection. Uh, look at what's going on into the boxes every now and again and say, yep, there's still door stops. There goes another one, another one. You know, that's what you do at that point. Uh, with a part where we're dealing with much tighter tolerances, this is gonna be a bit bigger of a challenge. Uh, we we have tight tolerances, so a visual inspection is not going to tell the tale. We need to actually measure stuff. Uh, this is how we're going to deal with risk the risk of potentially shipping bad product. Now, with something as critical as this, customer purchasing things like airplane parts uh, is probably going to inspect the part again when they receive it because of the risk of shipping damage and other things and there's that word again our buddy risk that we're talking about here um, now when they do and if they get different measurements than you did before you shipped your part we kind of have another different type of risk of sort because now we have the question of who's right uh, without calibration in this situation everything really just comes to a grinding halt because two conflicting measurements can't give us any way to reconcile who's right. It's just not possible at that point, unless one of those sets of in instruments has been calibrated and the other hasn't. In that case, then the measurement goes to the folks who with the calibrated instrument. Now, here's the real kicker. At that point, there is still no guarantee that they're right. However, what we're dealing with here, risk. The risk of them being wrong 
is significantly lower because they have traceability established with the measurement. Calibration manages a number of risks in this way. Uh, bad parts getting out the door, buyer rejection of good parts, um, and mostly just bad parts making it onto an airplane. That's the big one right here. Um, so from that perspective, you know, Heraclitus tells us that you can't step in the same river twice. And as such, things are always changing. It's a fact of nature and the laws of thermodynamics, entropy rules. That's the system is breaking down. It does so a little bit every day. And as such, so do your measurement tools. Here we talk about risk again and a word in front of calibration. And that word is periodic. So at this point, once again, different risk situation scenario. If you had your measurement tool calibrated five years ago, what has happened to it since? Maybe you, maybe you handle it meticulously. You store it properly, only allow highly skilled and trained folks to use it. And you have a high confidence in its stability over time. Maybe. Or maybe it's a shop tool that's rarely stored properly, typically used as a hammer and goes completely missing frequently. Obviously, these two scenarios elicit different risk strategies to handle, but the issue still stands that things change over time, and we need to understand the risk of how much change we're going to be comfortable with in determining a calibration schedule. Obviously, something that's stable and handled properly doesn't need the same frequency of calibration as does an item that's mishandled and misused. And in all honesty, in a number of those cases, you really can't perform calibration frequently enough to properly mitigate that risk. You need to employ other strategies at that point, like training and limiting use to folks who actually intend to handle things properly. Um, all the calibration in the world, not gonna fix that one. Sorry, folks. Um, however, periodic calibration is the name of the game here because even if something is mishandled or not mishandled, what we need to do is establish two points in time. And what we want to do is establish these two points and of traceability. And then we can make an albeit rough estimate of the performance of the vice between those two snapshots in time. If we get very similar measurements here and here in time, we can make a pretty good assumption that the measurements throughout its history between there are gonna be within some reasonable mark of those two periods in time. So that's what the risk management part really comes into play. What happens now if the measurement device is not performing well at that second point in time? What is the risk associated with that? Now, if you're calibrating your device, let's say once a year, do you need to go back over a whole year's worth of records to determine what might be suspect? That's not fun. I mean, could this actually potentially cause a product recall? Or do you have other systems in play to ensure that a single bad measurement of a product doesn't make the final say? That's another strategy as well. Better yet, this is kind of the best strategy here, um, is that we're going to use a measurement tool that is significantly better than the measurement it needs to make so that even if there is an out of tolerance measurement, an issue with the tool, the issue will be small enough compared to the product requirements that even if that product, that tool is way out of specification, that specification of the tool is so much tighter than the specification of the product that it really doesn't have a final impact on the actual product. So, couple different strategies there, a uh, couple different things to think about. Um, tool choices, why we do this, why it's important. Uh, so when you do think about 
risk management, 9001, or whatever standard you're dealing with, know that calibration plays many, many roles in this world and is really a key part of any risk management strategy. So a little on risk management. Hey, if you're a regular listener to the podcast, do me a huge favor, swing over to iTunes and throw me a rating. If you're listening on one of the other platforms, throw me a like. It just helps more people find us, helps more people get here, get some of this info, find some more things out, and help increase their knowledge and make everything better. I kind of like that. Um, if you got any questions, comments you just want to say hi how you doing you want to tell me i'm horrible whatever the case may be do me a huge favor drop by the website www.ptgurusulting.com uh, the upper right hand corner there's a little contact button hit there shoot me an email and i promise to get back to you as soon as possible uh, thanks for listening today i really appreciate you guys uh, i'll be gonna have a great week hope you're having a great weekend thank you so much yeah.